part five chapter five of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook helpers visitors and friends continued five on higher themes the correspondent to whom miss nightingale wrote most fully from her heart was from this time forth mr jowett their acquaintance at first confined to paper had begun as described in an earlier chapter with correspondence about her suggestions for thought the work had greatly interested him and from time to time he continued to write to her about it he wished her to do something with her suggestions but to rewrite them in a more connected form and a gentler mood and he sometimes gave hints for an irony less bitter than hers her letters to him are no longer in existence except in the case of a few of which she preserved copies but it is clear from the tenor of the correspondence on the other side that she was already eighteen sixty two giving to him much of her intimate confidence she had now met a new friend who was capable of entering into her inmost and highest thoughts not indeed always with an agreement but always with a sympathetic understanding as you have shown me so much confidence he presently wrote i feel the strongest wish to help you in any way that i can without intruding and again i cannot but wish you as sincerely as i ever desired anything unabated hope and trust and resolve to continue your work to the end and many rays of light to cheer the way a little later drawing a bow at a venture mr jowett wondered whether she was engaged about indian sanitary matters he had a reason for being interested about them which is that i lost my two brothers in india miss nightingale as we have heard was interested in nothing else so intently at this time and here was a fresh bond of sympathy she asked whether knowing what he did of her religious views he would come and administer the sacrament to her as she was entirely unable to leave her room i shall be very glad he wrote october three to give you the sacrament i am sure that many other clergymen would be equally glad would you like mr and mrs smith or any of their family to join you the sacrament was often thus administered and miss nightingale's most intimate friends such as mrs bracebridge or some of her family generally partook of the rite with her on one of the earlier of these occasions mr jowett met her parents and in eighteen sixty two paid the first of his visits which afterwards became frequent to them in the country he often figures in their letters as that great and good man or that true saint mr jowett and from this date also began his frequent visits usually many times a year to miss nightingale herself indeed he was seldom if ever in london without spending an afternoon with her if she had friends staying in her house such as monsieur and madame mole he would sometimes come in to dine with them dear miss nightingale wrote mr jowett october twenty eighth i shall always regard the circumstance of having given you the communion as a solemn event in my life which is a call to devote myself to the service of god and men if he will give me the power to do so your example will often come before me especially if i have occasion to continue my work under bodily suffering there is something that i want to say to you which i hardly know how to express and then followed the first of what became a long series of spiritual admonitions mr jowett had it is clear a very high opinion of miss nightingale's genius the most sincere admiration for her self-devotion and a deep affection for her but he thought that she was in some ways not using her life to the best advantage and that her state of physical and mental suffering was in some measure the result of a too impetuous temper in letter after letter full of a beautiful and delicate sympathy he whispered into her ears counsels of calm of trust of moderation she seems to have kept him informed of every move in her crusades and he was constantly afraid that she would fight too fiercely or even in this case a quite needless fear come out into the open 
the gift of being invisible he wrote april twenty two eighteen sixty three is much to be desired by any one who exercises a good influence over others though deborah and barak work together sisera the captain of the host must not suspect that he has been delivered into the hands of a woman i hope march eighteen sixty five that you won't leave your incognito it would seriously injure your influence if you were known to have influence did you know the baron stockmar whom sir robert peel called one of the most influential persons in europe hardly any one in england excepting kings and queens knew of his existence that was a model for that sort of life if you answer anonymously as i hope if at all may i beg you to answer with facts only and without a trace of feeling when he applauds some stroke he urges her to find rest and comfort in the victory all this he wrote february twenty sixth eighteen sixty five i firmly believe would not have been accomplished but for your clearness of sight and intensity of purpose is not this a thing to thank god about i was reading in grote an account of an attempted spartan revolution in the times of agesilaus one of the great objects of the ephori was to keep the spartan youth from getting under the influence of a woman name unknown who was stirring the rebellion do you not think that woman may have been you in some former state of existence miss nightingale perhaps in some justification for her eagerness in action opened her heart fully to mr jowett about her sense of loss in sidney herbert's death explaining her loneliness in work and yet her overmastering desire to complete while strength was still granted to her the joint work of her friend and herself i have often felt he replied august seventh eighteen sixty five what a wreck and ruin lord herbert's death must have been to you you had done so much for him and he had grown so rapidly in himself and in public estimation that there seemed no limits to what he might have effected he might have been one of the most popular and powerful prime ministers in this country the man to carry us through the social and ecclesiastical questions that are springing up and you would have had a great part in his work and filled him with every noble and useful ambition do not suppose that i don't feel and understand all this and you might have made me dean of christ's church the only preferment that i would like to have and i would have reformed the university and bullied the canons but it has pleased god that all this should not be and it must please us too and we must carry on the struggle under greater difficulties with more of hard and painful labour and less of success still never flinching while life lasts never flinching but never fretting or fuming that was the burden of mr jowett's exhortations i sometimes think he had written july ninth eighteen sixty five that you ought seriously to consider how your work may be carried on not with less energy but in a calmer spirit think that the work of god neither hastes nor rests and that we should go about it in the spirit of order which prevails in the world i am not blaming the past who would blame you who devote your life to the good of others but i want the peace of god to settle on the future perhaps you will feel that in urging this i really can form no notion of your sufferings alas dear friend i am afraid that this is true still i must beg you to keep your mind above them is that motive vain of being made perfect through suffering it is an idle speculation to wonder whether persons who have done great things in the world would have done as much or more or better if they had been other than they were calm is well but it is not always the spring of action if miss nightingale had been less eager and impetuous she might after her return from the crimea have done nothing at all but perhaps already in moments of weariness during the battle and increasingly as the shadows lengthened into the pensive evening of her days she may have felt that there was some truth in the soothing counsels of mr jowett's friendship that miss nightingale reciprocated his feelings of affectionate esteem is shown very clearly by the way in which she received his admonitions she was not usually meek under even the gentlest reproaches of her friends but so far as mr jowett's letters tell the story she never resented anything he said she expressed nothing but gratitude i do not suppose that she never retorted 
he advised her as he advised everybody to read boswell i gather from one of his letters that she may have reminded him of dr johnson's love of a good hater for mr jowett promises to try and satisfy her a little better in that respect in the future and as far as it was in him to do so he seems to have kept his word hang the hebdomadal council he wrote or of a certain meeting of another body i was opposed by two fools and a knave there are passages about rascals and rogue elephants and beasts which are almost as downright as was miss nightingale herself in this sort she returned to the full the sympathy which he gave to her she was solicitous about his health he promised to cut down his hours of reading and never to work any more after midnight i cannot resist such a remonstrance as yours i think that you would batter the gates of heaven or hell seriously i shall think of your letter as long as i live dear friend she asked to be kept informed of every move in the academical disputes which concerned him the judgment in the case of essays and reviews the dispute about the greek professorship and so forth he told her even of stupidities at college meetings not to be beaten he said of one even by your war office i think you are the only person he wrote eighteen sixty five who encourages me about my work at oxford i cannot be too grateful for your words i am delighted he wrote again october twenty seventh eighteen sixty six to have a friend who cares two straws whether i succeeded in a matter at oxford she as is clear from his letters wrote to him not only about her struggles and interests but also about his and he on his side discussed all her problems he wanted her to spend herself no longer on conflicts with government offices but to devote her mind to some literary work in which successful effect would depend only on herself in such work moreover he could perhaps help her she on her side would like to help him with a sermon the preparation of which was teasing him and there is a long draft amongst her papers of the heads of a discourse suggested by her on the relation of religion to politics i sometimes use your hints he had written earlier a pupil of mine has a passion for public life and having the means is likely to get into parliament i said to him you are a fanatic that cannot be helped but you must try to be a rational fanatic each of the friends thought very highly of the powers and services of the other there is nothing you might not accomplish he says to her he turns off what she must have said of him with playful deprecation about elijah you must mean the honourable elijah pogram there is no other elijah to whom i bear the least resemblance and each valued the friendship as a means of enabling them both to serve god more truly the spirit of the twenty-third psalm and the spirit of the ninetieth psalm should be united in our lives her friendship with mr jowett was i cannot doubt miss nightingale's greatest consolation in these strenuous years she was immersed in official drudgery never forgetful it is true of the end in the means but sorely vexed and harassed by the difficulties and disappointments of circumstance her friend's letters and conversation raised her above the conflict into a purer and calmer atmosphere not indeed that mr jowett was a quietist she would little have respected him had he been so but though in the world he was not of it he was unsoiled by the dust of the great road she had it is true other and yet more unworldly friends nuns in convents and matrons or nurses in hospitals with them too she exchanged intimate confidences in spiritual matters but their standpoint was not hers and the exchange could only be with mental reservations on her part to mr jowett she was able to open unreservedly her truest thoughts and then to the dearest of her other friends paid her an almost adoring worship while some who were estranged offered only unsympathetic criticism it was from mr jowett alone that she heard the language of affectionate and understanding remonstrance she heard it gladly because she knew that it was sympathetic and because she felt that her friend's character was attuned to her own highest ideals 
thirty years after the date at which we have now arrived eighteen sixty six miss nightingale read through the hundreds of letters she had received and kept from mr jowett she made copious extracts from them in pencil and sent several to his biographers many of his letters to her were included in his life though the name of the recipient was not disclosed she was jealous in her lifetime of the privacy of her life she rebuked mr jowett once for accepting a copy of her cousin's statuette of her he explained that he had placed it where it would not be observed i consider you he had already written a sort of royal personage not to be gossiped about with any one the letters to her hitherto published were selected to throw light upon his views in this memoir in which it has been decided to give if it may be a truthful picture of her life and character i select rather those letters which show the influence of his character upon hers the following was noted by miss nightingale as one of the most beautiful if not the most beautiful of the whole collection askrig july eighteen sixty four i am afraid that hard-working persons are very bad correspondents at least i know that i am or i should have written to you long ago which i have always a pleasure in doing but plato who is either my greatest friend or my greatest enemy and has finally swelled into three large volumes you will observe that i am proud of the size of my baby is to blame for preventing me this place at which i shall be staying for about five weeks longer is at the head of wensleydale high among mountains in a most beautiful country and what i think adds greatly to the charm of the country very pleasing for the simplicity and intelligence of the people among the enjoyments which i have here which notwithstanding plato are really very great i cannot help remembering you at one fifteen park street i wish you would venture to see something more of the sights and sounds of nature you will never persuade me that your way of life is altogether the best for health any more than i could persuade you into mr gladstone's doctrine of the salubrity of living over a churchyard as to the rest i have no doubt that you could not be better than you are i don't wish to exaggerate for you are the last person to whom i should think of offering compliments but i certainly believe that it has been a great national good that you have taken up the whole question of the sanitary condition of the soldier and not confined yourself to hospitals the difficulties and stupidities would have been as great in the case of the hospitals and the object really far inferior in importance besides you could never have gained the influence over medical men with their professional jealousies that you have had over the war office and the indian government also if your life is spared a few years longer a great deal more may be done there are many resources that are not yet exhausted therefore never listen to the voice that tells you in a moment of weariness or pain that you ought to have adhered to your old vocation i suppose there have been persons who have had so strong italics a sense of the identity of their own action with the will of god as to exclude every other feeling who have never wished to live nor wished to die except as they fulfil his will End of italics. can we acquire this i don't know but italics such a sense of things would no doubt give infinite rest and almost infinite power End of italics. perhaps quietists have been most successful in gaining this sort of feeling but the quietists are not the people who have passed all their lives rubbing and fighting against the world but italics i don't see why active life might not become a sort of passive life too passive in the hands of god and in the fulfilment of the laws of nature i sometimes fancy that there are possibilities of human character much greater than have been realized End of italics. mysteries as they may be called of character and manner and style which remain to be called forth and explained one great field for thought on this subject is the manner in which character may grow and change quite late in life the rest of the letter is about the politics of the day the passages which i have printed in italics are those which miss nightingale has specially marked can we help one another he wrote in the following year march five eighteen sixty five to make life a higher and nobler sort of thing more of a calm and peaceful and never-ending service of god perhaps a little the marked passages show in what way miss nightingale found in mr jowett's friendship a source of comfort 
and a fresh inspiration towards her own spiritual ideals in her meditations of later years a greater passivity in action was the state of perfection which she constantly sought to attain mr jowett as will have been noted sought to reassure her about her concentration for the most part upon work for the army and for india and indeed she was herself intensely devoted to it nor was it ever deposed from a principal place in her thoughts and interests yet there were times as shown in a letter already quoted when she felt that this work insistently though it appealed to her though it was bound up with some of her fondest memories was all the while if not a kind of desertion yet at best only a temporary call her first call from god had been to service in another sort and she was anxious to make peace with those first affections in january eighteen sixty four she sent these instructions to mrs bracebridge who directed that if miss nightingale should survive her they were to be handed on to mrs sutherland you know that i always believed it to be god's will for me that i should live and die in hospitals when this call he has made upon me for other work stops and i am no longer able to work i should wish to be taken to st thomas's hospital and to be placed in a general ward which is what i should have desired had i come to my end as a hospital matron and i beg you to be so very good as to see that this my wish is accomplished whenever the time comes if you will take the trouble as a true friend which you always have been are and will be and this will make me die in peace because i believe it to be god's will it was not so to be but we shall find on opening the next part in the story of miss nightingale's long life that she was presently to have time for helping forward the movement which she had promoted as a reformer of hospitals and as the founder of modern nursing into a new and a wider field end of helpers visitors and friends continued five part five chapter six of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook new masters eighteen sixty six parts one two and three among new men strange faces other minds tennyson the year eighteen sixty six was one of stirring events both at home and abroad it saw the downfall of the whig administration which with a brief interval eighteen fifty eight to fifty nine had held office under different chiefs since december eighteen fifty two in march mr gladstone now leader of the house of commons introduced a reform bill of which the fortunes were uncertain owing to the descent of the adullamites under mr lowe on april twenty seven the second reading was carried by a majority of five only on june eighteen the government was defeated in committee on lord dunkellin's amendment and resigned on the day before lord russell's government was defeated war was declared between austria and her allies on the one side and prussia and italy on the other prussia armed with her new breech-loading gun quickly defeated austria the foundation of the future german empire under the hegemony of prussia was laid and italy as part of the price of a victory not hers received from austria the province of venetia of these great events some brought consequences with them to causes in which miss nightingale was deeply interested whilst others made direct demands on her exertions the earlier months of the year were thus a period of continuous and almost feverish activity on her part two of her letters the former written when the fate of the government was still trembling in the balance the latter written when the new government had been installed and when the war was raging on the continent will serve to introduce the subjects of this chapter 
miss nightingale to harriet martineau thirty five south street may two eighteen sixty six we have been rather in a fever lately because ministers were hovering between in and out mr villiers promised us a bill quite early in the year for a london uniform poor rate for the sick and consolidated hospitals under a central management this was before we got our earls and archbishops and m p s together to storm him in his den we shall not get our bill this session for mr villiers is afraid of losing the government one vote but we shall certainly get it in time in eighteen sixty the consolations of the future never failed me for a moment and i find them now an equally secure resource can you guess who wrote those words they are in a note from mr gladstone written the morning of his speech on the franchise bill could you have believed he was so much in earnest i could not and yet i knew him once very well his speech he was ill impressed the house very much and e'en the ranks of tuscany could scarce forbear to cheer miss nightingale to julius mole thirty five south street july twelfth eighteen sixty six i have been in the thick of all these changes of government i should like if you had been in england to have shown you the notes i have had from those going out and those coming in especially from my own peculiar masters lord de grey and lord stanley they are so much more serious and anxious than the world gives them credit for i used to think public opinion was higher than private opinion i now think just the reverse as for the times and about all these german affairs i believe the times to be a faithful reflection of the public opinion of our upper classes see what it is last week prussia and bismarck were the greatest criminals in europe this week the needle gun i mean prussia and bismarck no i mean the needle gun is a constitutional protestant or a protestant constitution i'm not sure which but i was going to tell you lord stanley has taken the foreign office how he or anybody could take willingly the foreign office england having now so little weight in european councils in preference to the india office which lord stanley created and where we create the future of one hundred and fifty millions of men one can't understand lord stanley accepted the foreign office solely because he could not help it lord clarendon which i saw under his own hand having unhesitatingly declined it although lord derby made the most vehement love to him even to offering to him the nomination of half the places in the cabinet this i heard from lord clarendon himself like you i can't sleep or eat for thinking of this war i can't distract my thoughts from it because you know it is my business i am consulted on both sides as to their hospital and sanitary arrangements and then those stupid italians publish parts of my letter just the froth at the end you know while i had given them a solid pudding of advice at their own request publish it cruelly without my leave with my address since which my doors have been besieged by all exiles of all nations asking to be sent to italy and women threatening to accoucher sick in my passage i sometimes think i must give up business that is work or life it would take two strong policemen to keep my beggars in check no one could believe the stories i should have to tell people who beg of me whom i might just as well beg of a sheet missing of course now i have to begin again at the very beginning with mr gathorne hardy at the poor law board to get our metropolitan workhouse infirmary bill it was a cruel disappointment to me to see the bill go just as i had it in my grasp also a public health service organization for sir john lawrence in india which i lost by twenty-four hours owing to lord de grey's going out however i am well-nigh done for life is too hard for me 
i have suffered so very much all the winter and spring for which nothing did me any good but a curious new-fangled little operation of putting opium in under the skin which relieves one for twenty-four hours but does not improve the vivacity or serenity of one's intellect when ministers went out i had hopes for a time from a committee of the house of commons on which serves john stuart mill on the special local government of the metropolis at their request i wrote them a long letter then because it is july and they are rather hot they give it up for this year the change of ministers which brings hard work to us drudges releases the house of commons men alas there is a pathetic story of balzac's in which a poor woman who had followed the russian campaign was never able to articulate any word except adieu 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 i am afraid of going mad like her and not being able to articulate any word but alas 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 f n part two of the events over which miss nightingale cried alas in this letter the one which came first was the loss of mr villiers's poor law bill the loss however as she rightly surmised in writing to miss martineau was only temporary the whole subject is connected with a distinct branch of miss nightingale's work of which a description must be reserved for the next chapter she was in large measure as we shall hear the founder of sick nursing among the indigent poor and a pioneer in poor law reform the next event is connected with a subject with which we have already made acquaintance miss nightingale lost by twenty-four hours the opportunity of organizing a public health service in india for sir john lawrence the story of this lost opportunity and its retrieval illustrate the truth of something said already namely the difference it made that there was in london in the person of miss nightingale a resolute enthusiast to whom the question of indian sanitation was not one of a thousand questions but the one question of absorbing interest that the opportunity of which she spoke was lost was not as by this time the reader will hardly need to be told in any way whatever the fault of miss nightingale it is a curious story and is the subject of a great mass of correspondence amongst her papers a mass eloquent of the eager interest and infinite trouble which she devoted to the matter but the story itself admits of being told succinctly a few words however are first necessary on the essential issues it was not a case of much ado about nothing the whole future of sanitary progress in india was or might reasonably be thought to be at stake under the energetic rule of sir john lawrence a good start had been made the governor-general continued to report progress to miss nightingale and suggestions which she sent were communicated by him to his officers but the larger questions of organization had still to be settled sir john's eagerness as a sanitary reformer was in some measure held in check by shortage of money sanitary works as lord salisbury remarked at a later stage of the affair are uniformly costly works miss nightingale's view was that whether advance was to be slower or quicker the organization should be on lines which would ensure the importance of advance being constantly kept in mind she insisted that the public health service in india should be a separate service responsible to the governor-general in council not a subordinate branch tucked away under some other department this is the burden of many letters and memoranda from her hand early in eighteen sixty six a double opportunity seemed to offer itself to miss nightingale for advancing her cause at the beginning of february sir charles wood resigned office and her friend lord de grey became secretary of state for india in his place at the same time she had received an important letter from the governor-general dated calcutta january nineteen 
her friend mr ellis who had been in conclave as we have heard with her and her circle had shortly before submitted proposals to him sir john lawrence wrote to her as regards the reconstruction of our sanitary organizations we are sending home to the secretary of state a copy of mr ellis's note which he sent me and are proposing a further change somewhat in accordance with his plan i have no doubt that you will see the dispatch and therefore i had better not send it to you he then went on to give a summary of its contents the summary was brief and allowed of different opinions as to the ultimate bearing of the governor-general's proposals he had assumed as a matter of course that she would be shown his dispatch and she applied to her official friends for a sight of it they would be delighted if they had it but they had received no such dispatch perhaps it would come by the next mail but it did not nor by the next nor the next for a very simple reason as will presently appear miss nightingale put on her friend mr ellis who as the head of a presidency health commission had a direct locus standi to inquire and even to search at the india office they swear by their gods he reported that they have no such dispatch miss nightingale was becoming desperate she was perfectly certain that sir john lawrence must have sent it meanwhile the home government was tottering to its fall the new secretary of state might be one who knew not miss nightingale she entreated that a further search should be made on may five she was told that at last the sanitary minute had been found and a copy of it was sent for her consideration it had been attached to some papers connected with the financial department and thus had escaped attention lord de grey begged miss nightingale to let him have the benefit of her opinion upon it as soon as possible she afterwards learnt that it was the secretary of state himself who with his own hands had searched for and found the governor-general's minute it had escaped attention for nearly four months the incident did not raise miss nightingale's opinion of government offices or lessen her sense of responsibility in the duty of keeping the sanitary question to the fore she was ill when the minister's message arrived but she at once set to work and on may the seventh she sent in a memorandum giving a summary of her views and pointing out wherein the governor-general's proposal seemed to require revision if the recommendations of the royal commission were to be carried out effectually the minister was busy with many things his own fate and that of his colleagues were in peril every day a month intervened before the next move was taken on june eleventh miss nightingale was asked by lord de grey through captain galton to develop her views further and to draw up in consultation with dr sutherland a draft letter which he could submit to the indian council as his reply to sir john lawrence the letter was to take the form either of a practical scheme to propose to sir john lawrence for the sanitary administration of india or of such a description of the requirements as would draw from sir j l a practical scheme it was suggested that perhaps it would be best if the letter one shadowed out the requirements and two sketched a scheme of administration for carrying them out this was a large order and took time on june nineteenth miss nightingale sent in her draft she was twenty-four hours too late and on june eighteen the government had been defeated there was however a short period of grace owing to the absence of the queen at balmoral and to her unwillingness to accept lord russell's resignation lord de grey had no time to pass the letter through the secretary of state's council but he did what he could he left on record at the india office he told miss nightingale a minute closely following the lines of her memorandum if his successor let the matter go to sleep again lord de grey would be ready to call attention to it in parliament he assured miss nightingale his interest in such questions 
would remain as warm as ever and as she was now more likely than he to know what was going on he begged her to keep him informed part three so then she had been too late i am furious to that degree she wrote to captain galton june twenty three at having lost lord de grey's five months at the india office that i am fit to blow you all to pieces with an infernal machine of my own invention she threw some of the blame upon dr sutherland whose mission to the mediterranean she had not been able to cancel and who for weeks at a time during this year was absent at malta and gibraltar or in algiers algiers indeed she wrote tauntingly why not astley's that would be quite as good a change for him sometimes she varied the figure and dr sutherland and his party figured in her letters as wombwell's menagerie the menagerie i hear she wrote january twenty six including three ladies h m commissioners and two ladies maids has gone after a column in the interior had he stayed at home he might have been able to find the missing dispatch and in any case they could have written at leisure from the hints in sir john lawrence's letter to her the memorandum which they ultimately had to write in haste the truant seems to have foreseen what a rod in pickle was awaiting him on his return i have been thinking he wrote to her from algiers january twenty eighth will she be glad to hear from me or will she swear i don't know but nevertheless i will tell her a bit of my mind about our visit to astley's and he goes on to write an admirable account of his experiences in which he ingeniously emphasizes the vast importance of his inquiries in connection with their indian work nor was this only an excuse dr sutherland's report on algeria and the french sanitary service there was a most valuable piece of work it is impossible to read his writings whether in published reports or in his manuscripts among miss nightingale's papers without perceiving how well based was the reliance which she placed upon his collaboration his wife stayed at home and saw much of miss nightingale mrs sutherland must have reported the state of things in south street for a month later dr sutherland wrote thus to miss nightingale february twenty the mail which ought to have arrived yesterday came in to-day and i am trying to save the out-mail which leaves the harbour at twelve without much prospect of success i have had a letter to-day from home about you and if it had come yesterday ellis and i would certainly have been embarking to-day for england after the account of your suffering and of the pressure of business under which you are sinking i feel wild to get away from this to-night we leave algeria and by the time you get this we will be on our way home god bless you and keep you to us amen well i can only hope that dr sutherland enjoyed his trip while it lasted for i fear that he may have had a bad quarter of an hour when he reported himself at south street on his return she had complained of his absence to another of her close allies dr farr i have all dr sutherland's business to do she wrote january nineteen besides my own if it could be done i should not mind i had just as soon wear out in two months as in two years so the work be done but it can't it is just like two men going into business with a million each the one suddenly withdraws the other may wear himself to the bone but he can't meet the engagements with one million which he made with two add to this i have been so ill since the beginning of the year as to be often unable to have my position moved from pain for forty-eight hours at a time but to business one good stroke of business however miss nightingale had been able to do during dr sutherland's absence she reported it to dr farr the compensation to my disturbed state of mind has been a convert to the sanitary cause i have made for madras no less a person than lord napier i managed to scramble up to see him before he sailed the conversion means not necessarily that lord napier needed to find salvation but refers rather to the fact that his predecessor in the governorship of madras had been unsympathetic 
lord napier on receiving the appointment had expressed a desire to learn miss nightingale's views he had been secretary to the british embassy at constantinople during the crimean war and had there formed a high opinion of her ability and devotion she now wrote to him about indian sanitary reform and he at once replied lord napier to miss nightingale twenty four prince's gate february sixteen eighteen sixty six i beg you to believe that i am far from being impatient of your communication or indifferent to your wishes i have read your letter with great interest and i regret that you had not time and strength to make it longer you will confer a great favour on me by sending me the eight octavo volume of which you speak and i would not stumble at the two folio blue books the sanitary question like the railway question or the irrigation question will probably remain subordinated in some degree to financial requirements to the necessity of showing a surplus at the end of the year but within the limits of my available resources i promise you a zealous intervention on behalf of the cause you have so much at heart you say that you do not know me well but you cannot deprive me of the happiness and honour of having seen you at the greatest moment of your life in the little parlour of the hospital at scutari i was a spectator and i would have been a fellow labourer if any one would have employed my services i remain at your orders for any day and hour very sincerely yours napier their interview took place three days later lord napier during his governorship of madras which lasted six years tried hard to fulfil his promise to other matters he attended also but it was to questions connected with the public health that he devoted his most particular attention and throughout his residence in india he kept up a correspondence with miss nightingale about them End of new masters 1866 parts one two and three part five chapter six of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook new masters eighteen sixty six continued parts four five and six meanwhile on the immediate question of the moment she had been too late and her political friends were out she was a whig and a keen reformer but she was a sanitarian before she was a politician and as soon as the whigs fell she was on the alert to make friends for her causes with the mammon of unrighteousness she was eager to hear the earliest political news miss nightingale to captain galton june twenty seven now do write to a wretched female f n about who is to come in where does general peel come to the war office if so will he annihilate our civil sanitary element is sutherland to go all the same to malta and gibraltar this autumn will general peel imperil the army sanitary commission i must know ye infernal powers is mr lowe to come in to the india office it is all unmitigated disaster to me for as lord stanley is to be foreign office the only place where he can be of no use to us i shall not have a friend in the world if i were to say more i should fall to swearing i am so indignant ever yours furiously f n captain galton replied that he had it from mr lowe himself that he would not join the tories that of the actual appointments he had not as yet heard but that as the secretary of states was an impersonal office dr sutherland's commission to visit the mediterranean would still hold good or bad you say the s of s is an impersonal creature replied miss nightingale july three i wish he was when the names of the new ministers were announced captain galton threw out a suggestion tentatively that lord cranbourne india office might be approachable through lady cranbourne i have a much better recommendation to him than that wrote miss nightingale in some triumph july seven 
and have already been put into direct communication with him not at my own request the letters tell the story of her introduction to new masters at the india office and the poor law board lord stanley to miss nightingale st james's square july six i shall see lord cranbourne to-day we go down to be sworn in and will tell him the whole sanitary story and also say that i have advised you to write to him as you have always done to me to my great advantage you will find him shrewd industrious and a good man of business miss nightingale to lord cranbourne thirty five south street july seventeen lord stanley had the kindness to advise me to write to you and to tell me that he would tell you that he had advised me to write to you as i have done to him this is my only excuse for what would otherwise be a very great impertinence and what i fear may seem to you such even now viz my present application to you on the india public health question i know i ought to begin miss nightingale presents her compliments to lord cranbourne but the third person always becomes confused lord stanley has probably scarcely had the time to tell you my long story i fear therefore i must introduce myself by saying that my apology for what you may justly consider an unwarrantable interference must be the part i have taken in the public health of the army in india for the last eight years having been in communication with lord stanley sir c wood and lord de grey about it and being now in constant communication with sir john lawrence and others in india on the same subject when lord de grey left office lord stanley of his own accord kindly asked whether he should put me in direct communication with you this is my general apology my particular one is that by last mail i received some very pressing letters from india on the subject of the introduction of an efficient public health administration into india which is after this wise the spirit of the very general recommendations made by the r commission which reported in eighteen sixty three presided over by lord stanley had never been completely acted up to there have been difficulties and clashings in consequence a minute of january nine eighteen sixty six was sent home by sir john lawrence proposing to connect the public health service with the inspectorship of prisons the proposal appears to have been made without due consideration of the importance and greatness of the duties if it were carried out it would put an end we believe to any prospect of efficient progress i think i am correct in saying that lord stanley concurs in this view lord de grey was deeply impressed with this defect in the scheme he drew up a minute just before he left office in order to leave his views on record for you setting forth generally the duties and asking for a reconsideration of the subject in india before the organization was finally decided on of the public health service i would now venture to ask your favourable consideration for this proposal because on the organization of a service adequate for the object depends the entire future of the public health in india we commit ourselves into your hands lord cranbourne to miss nightingale india office july seventeen i am much obliged to you for your letter and especially for your kindness in relieving me from the literary effort of composing a letter or series of letters in the third person lord stanley spoke to me about the sanitary question some days ago and told me i should probably hear from you i have made inquiries as to the dispatch you mention and find that it is in the office still awaiting decision no confirmation of it shall take place until i have communicated further with you upon the subject i shall not be able to go into the sanitary question until i have disposed of the claims of the indian officers which according to all the best authorities are very urgently in need of immediate settlement but as soon as that is done with i hope that the sanitary question may be taken up without delay mr gaythorne hardy to miss nightingale poor law board july twenty five you owe me no apology for calling my attention to material points connected with the subject in the consideration of which you are so much engaged i should say this to any one who wrote in the same spirit as yourself 
but i am really indebted to you who have earned no common title to advise and suggest upon anything which affects the treatment of the sick your note arrived at the very instant when a gentleman was urging me to lay before you questions relating to workhouse infirmaries and i should not have hesitated to do so if needful even without the cordial invitation which you give me to ask your assistance at present i have not advanced very far from want of time as while parliament is sitting i am necessarily very much occupied with other business and i am anxious to remedy if possible present and urgent grievances before i enter thoroughly upon legislation for the future i shall bear in mind the offer which you have made and in all probability avail myself of it to the full so then perhaps miss nightingale would not be left wholly friendless after all she was to have new masters would they or would they not accept her service we shall hear in due course part five meanwhile miss nightingale had been very busily engaged in the correspondence and other tasks thrown upon her by the outbreak of war in europe saw florence for half an hour this morning reported her father june over fatigued certainly but speaking with a voice only too loud and strong princess alice of hesse writes to her to ask for instructions for the hospitals there and sutherland's joke is there's nothing left for you all is gone to garibaldi she had been applied to by representatives of all three combatants prussia as usual was the better prepared and the crown princess had written to miss nightingale in march three months before hostilities actually began asking for her assistance and advice about hospital and nursing arrangements a prussian manufacturer communicated with her about the best form of hospital tents for field service the two sisters of the british royal house were on opposite sides in this war for hesse darmstadt had thrown in its lot with austria but it was not till after the outbreak of hostilities that the princess alice wrote to miss nightingale through lady eli for advice about war hospitals miss nightingale at once sent it her memorandum she was told july three had been forwarded to prince louis for use at headquarters and the princess begged her to send further information for use by the hospital authorities in darmstadt the italians had been earlier in going to miss nightingale the secretary of the florence committee for helping the sick and wounded had written to her for advice in may i have read the letter he wrote which will be translated and inserted in the nazione miss nightingale gives with her accustomed clearness and precision excellent advice to the committee which some of them very much need at the same time she expresses her cordial sympathy with the italian cause she recalls the admirable condition in which the sardinian army was landed in the crimea and the praise which its appearance extorted from lord clyde and she concludes her letter by saying that if the sacrifice of her poor life would hasten their cause by one half hour she would gladly give it them but she is a miserable invalid the committee had asked whether she would not come to italy were it but for one day in order to inspire them by her presence her piece of froth as she called it was widely printed in the italian press she had deplored the outbreak of the war but when it resulted in an extension of the boundaries of free italy she felt that there were compensations miss nightingale also joined the committee of the ladies association formed in this country for the relief of the sick and wounded of all nations engaged she advised the committee on the form of aid most requisite and at the end of the war in thanking the crown princess of prussia for a letter she gave her royal highness an account of what had been done by the english committee the correspondence with the princess was long and it formed a new tie between miss nightingale and mr jowett who was a great favourite with the crown princess and who entertained a very high opinion of her abilities the answering letter from the princess covers eighteen pages containing as dr sutherland said of it just the kind of practical information which a person who has had experience in these matters desires to obtain a characteristic extract or two from the correspondence on each side must here suffice 
miss nightingale to the crown princess of prussia thirty five south street september twenty two eighteen sixty six i think your royal highness may be pleased to hear even the humble opinion of an old campaigner like myself about how well the army hospital service was managed in the late terrible war information reached me through my old friends and trainers of kaiserswerth the knights of st john of jerusalem took charge of all the deaconesses and all the offers of houses and rooms made to them the system seems to me to have been admirably managed especially the sending away the wounded in hundreds to towns where rooms and houses and nursing were offered the overcrowding and massing together of large numbers of wounded is always more disastrous than battle itself from many different quarters i have heard of the great devotion skill and generous kindness of the prussian surgeons to all sides alike on this the day of manon's death nine years ago the exiled dictator of venice and one of the purest and most far-seeing of statesmen who fought so good a battle for the freedom of venice but who did not live to see its accomplishment i cannot but congratulate your royal highness at the risk of impertinence at seeing the fulfilment of that liberation brought about by prussian arms the crown princess of prussia to miss nightingale new palace potsdam september twenty nine i was delighted to receive your long and interesting letter yesterday and hasten to express my warmest thanks for it every appreciation of prussia in england can but give me the greatest pleasure as you are such an advocate for fresh air i cannot refrain from telling you what i have myself seen in confirmation of your opinion on the subject and what i am sure would interest dear sir james clark who is your great ally on this point in a small well-kept hospital where wounded soldiers had been taken care of for some time the wounds in several cases did not seem to improve the general state of health of the patients did not show any progress they were feverish and the appearance of the wounds was that of the beginning of mortification in the garden of the hospital there was a shed or summer-house of rough boards with a wooden roof the little building was quite open in front and on the other sides closed up with boards but with an aperture of two feet all the way under the roof so that it was like being out of doors six patients were moved down into this shed sorely against their will they were afraid of catching cold the very next day they got better the fever left them the condition of the wounds became healthy they enjoyed their summer-house in spite of two violent storms which knocked down the tables and all quickly recovered i had seen them every day upstairs and saw them every day in the garden the difference was incredible the crown prince wishes me to say what pleasure it gives him to hear you speak in praise of our prussian army surgeons i remain ever dear miss nightingale yours sincerely victoria crown princess of prussia and princess royal among other details a particular kind of field ambulance was mentioned by the crown princess as having proved very useful miss nightingale at once put dr longmore of our own hospital service in possession of the facts it will have been seen that miss nightingale's experience was much requisitioned in the war of eighteen sixty six but the organization of war nursing under the red cross had not then attained full development owing to the fact that the austrian government had not ratified the geneva convention of eighteen sixty four in eighteen sixty seven a gold medal was awarded to miss nightingale by the conference of red cross societies at paris in eighteen seventy march thirty one the austrian patriotic society for the relief of wounded soldiers elected her an honorary member part six the year eighteen sixty six was then one of great activity with miss nightingale but by the middle of august her work was not at such high pressure as in the preceding months parliament was up and the new ministers with whom she had established friendly relations were turning round at this time a home call came to miss nightingale her mother was reported to be ailing she was disinclined to make the usual move with her husband from hampshire to derbyshire so while the father went to lee hurst miss nightingale decided to stay with her mother at embley 
it was an event in the family circle for florence had not been to either of the homes for ten years there was much correspondence and many preparations father and mother were equally delighted and the journey in an invalid carriage did the daughter no serious harm she stayed at embley from the middle of august till the end of november it was the first holiday she had taken for ten years also but it was not much of a holiday either she set to work on the health of romsey the nearest town and of winchester the county town she wrote up to her friend dr farr at the registrar-general's office for the mortality tables found the figures for those towns above the average and bade the citizens look to their drains then she commanded dr sutherland to embley for the transaction of business in view of next year's session she found her mother happy and cheerful i don't think my dear mother was ever more touching or interesting to me she wrote to madame mole august twenty one than she is now in her state of dilapidation she is so much gentler calmer more thoughtful she was a little critical however of her mother still and thought her habits self-indulgent poor lady she was seventy-eight she had been shaken and bruised in a carriage accident and was threatened with the loss of her eyesight certainly florence was not always able to make due allowances for other people but if she was critical of others she was yet more severe with herself during this holiday at embley she resumed those written self-examinations and meditations for which frequent in her earlier years she seems to have found little time during the strenuous decade eighteen fifty six to sixty six i never failed in energy she said once in later years but to do everything from the best motive that is quite another thing in reviewing her past life on october twenty one eighteen sixty six the anniversary of her departure for the crimea and on subsequent days she seems to have had a like thought her meditations were not so much of what she had done as of what she had done amiss her resolutions were of greater purity of motive and greater peace through a more entire trust in god called to be the handmaid of the lord and i have complained of my suffering life what return does god expect from me and with what purity of heart and intention should i make an offering of myself to him the word of the lord unto thee he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth but when we are ill how can we be like god i look up and see the drops of dew blue golden green and red glittering in the sun on the top of the deciduous cypress that is like god we see him for a moment we perceive his beauty it lights us even when we lie here prostrate blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god in all temptation trials and aridities in the agony and bloody sweat in the cross and passion this is not the prerogative of the future life but of the present end of new masters eighteen sixty six continued parts four five and six part six chapter one of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook many threads eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy two i beg of you and pray you to look back upon the past with thankfulness and upon the future with hope when there has been so much done and there is so much to do many beginnings and ravelled threads to be woven in and completed benjamin jowett letter to miss nightingale eighteen sixty seven chapter one workhouse reform eighteen sixty four to eighteen sixty seven parts one two and three from the first i had a sort of fixed faith that florence nightingale could do anything and that faith is still fresh in me and so it came to pass that the instant that name entered the lists i felt the fight was virtually won and i feel this still h b farnall poor law inspector december eighteen sixty six 
fifty years ago the state of things which miss nightingale had seen and cured in the military hospitals during the crimean war was almost equalled and was in some respects surpassed in scandal by the condition of the peace hospitals for the sick poor at home those hospitals were the sick wards or infirmaries of workhouses for the hospitals usually so called skim only the surface of sickness in any great town the state of the metropolitan workhouses as reported upon by the poor law board in eighteen sixty six showed that the sick wards were for the most part insanitary and overcrowded that the beds were insufficient and admirably contrived to induce sores that the eating and drinking vessels were unclean that there was a deficiency of basins towels brushes and combs that the food for the patients was cooked by paupers and frequently served cold that although the medical officers did their duty to the best of their ability the attendance given and the salaries paid were inadequate to the needs of the sick as for the nursing it was done by paupers many of whom could neither read nor write whose love of drink often drove them to rob the sick of stimulants and whose treatment of the poor was characterized neither by judgment nor by gentleness this is the restrained euphemism of an official report sometimes a patient would miss the ministration of a nurse for days because the pauper charged to give it was herself bedridden the rule of one nurse was to give medicine three times a day to the very ill and once to the rather ill it was administered in a gallipot the nurse poured out the medicine and judged according cases were reported in which a patient's bed was not made for five days and nights in which patients had no food from four o'clock in the afternoon of one day to eight o'clock in the morning of the next in which patients died or to speak more correctly were killed by the most wanton neglect the dawn of a better day came with the passing of the metropolitan poor act of eighteen sixty seven an act which figures in histories of the poor law in this country as the starting point of the modern development of poor law medical relief many persons contributed to this reform in the case of london a commission instituted by the lancet under mr ernest hart which afterwards developed into the association for the improvement of the infirmaries of london workhouses should especially be mentioned but the person who inspired the proper nursing of the sick poor and who behind the scenes was a prime mover in the legislation of eighteen sixty seven was florence nightingale part two the reform began in liverpool and the initiative was due to a philanthropist of that city mr william rathbone he used to speak of miss nightingale as his beloved chief and she when he died sent a wreath inscribed in remembrance and humblest love of one of god's best and greatest sons his voluminous correspondence with her began in eighteen sixty one when he was desirous of introducing a system of district nursing among the poor of liverpool there were no trained nurses anywhere to be had and he consulted miss nightingale she suggested to him that liverpool had better train nurses for itself in its own principal hospital the royal infirmary mr rathbone took up the idea and built a training school and home for nurses this institution provided nurses both for the royal infirmary and for poor patients in their own homes miss nightingale gave to all mr rathbone's plans as close and constant consideration as if she were going to be herself the matron the scheme was started in eighteen sixty two and it proved so great a success that mr rathbone was encouraged to attempt an extension of his benevolent enterprise the workhouse infirmary at liverpool was believed to be better than most places of its kind but there as elsewhere the nursing if so it could be called was done by able-bodied pauper women 
able-bodied women who enter workhouses are never among the mentally and morally efficient and in a seaport like liverpool they were of an especially low and vicious kind the work of the nurses selected from this unpromising material was superintended by a very small number of paid but untrained parish officers who were in the habit it was said of wearing kid gloves in the wards to protect their hands all night a policeman patrolled some of the wards to keep order while others in which the inmates were too sick or infirm to make disturbance were locked up and left unvisited all night on january thirty one eighteen sixty four mr rathbone wrote to miss nightingale propounding a plan for introducing a staff of trained nurses and promising to guarantee the cost for a term of years if she would help with counsel and by finding a suitable lady superintendent he asked for two letters one for influence to be shown to the vestry the other for his private advice she and dr sutherland drew up the required documents she arranged that twelve nightingale nurses should be sent from st thomas's hospital and she selected a lady superintendent a choice on which as both she and mr rathbone felt everything would depend the vestry agreed in may to accept mr rathbone's scheme but many months passed before it was actually launched there has been as much diplomacy wrote miss nightingale to the mother of the bermondsey convent september three eighteen sixty four and as many treaties and as much of people working against each other as if we had been going to occupy a kingdom instead of a workhouse the correspondence forms one of the bulkiest bundles among miss nightingale's papers the lady superintendent the pioneer of workhouse nursing was miss agnes jones an irish girl daughter of colonel jones of fahan londonderry and the niece of sir john lawrence she was attractive and rich young and witty but intensely religious and devoted to her work ideal in her beauty miss nightingale said of her like a louis fourteenth shepherdess she was one of the many girls who had been thrilled by miss nightingale's volunteering for the crimea perhaps it is well she wrote when entering st thomas's hospital that i shall bear the name of a nightingale probationer for that honoured name is associated with my first thought of hospital life in the winter of eighteen fifty four when i had those first longings for work and had for months so little to satisfy them how i wished i were competent to join the nightingale band when they started for the crimea i listened to the animadversions of many but i almost worshipped her who braved them all in eighteen sixty miss jones followed in her heroine's steps to kaiserswerth in eighteen sixty two she introduced herself to miss nightingale who advised her to complete her apprenticeship by a year's training at st thomas's hitherto the matron reported to miss nightingale february twenty five eighteen sixty three i have had no lady probationer equal on all points to miss jones after completing her year's training at st thomas's she took service as a nurse in the great northern hospital and she was there when the invitation came to liverpool miss jones was at first diffident but after an interview with miss nightingale the conviction was borne in upon her as she wrote that it was god's call and therefore must be obeyed in trust and with good hope in the history of modern nursing in this country the sixteenth of may eighteen sixty five is a date only less memorable than the twenty fourth of june eighteen sixty on the earlier day the nightingale training school was opened at st thomas's on the latter twelve trained nightingale nurses began work in the liverpool infirmary and the reform of workhouse nursing was therein inaugurated miss jones herself had arrived a few weeks earlier 
mr rathbone felt the importance of the occasion and marked it by a pretty attention to miss nightingale i beg he wrote may twelve miss nightingale's birthday to be allowed to constitute myself your gardener to the extent of doing what i have long wished providing a flower-stand for your room and keeping it supplied with plants i hope you will not be offended with my presumption or refuse me the great pleasure of thinking that in your daily work you may have with you a reminder of my affectionate gratitude for all you have done for our town and for me if the plants will only flourish as the good seed you have planted here is doing they will be bright enough and as for my personal obligations you can never know how great they are to you for guiding me to and in this work mr rathbone and other kindly liverpool men among whom mr j w cropper should be remembered were equally thoughtful of miss jones at their own expense they furnished rooms for her in the workhouse and made them bright with flowers and pictures but it was a formidable task to which she was called and the pleasantness of her rooms made the workhouse wards look yet more terrible she said by contrast a young woman well-bred sensitive and refined accustomed as yet only to well-appointed hospitals was thrown into the rough and tumble of great pauper wards where the officials though well-intentioned had necessarily caught something of the surrounding atmosphere your kind letter she had written to miss nightingale after a preliminary visit august eighteen sixty four came in answer to earnest prayer and gave me courage so that even now while waiting for the committee i do not feel nervous the governor has promised me every cooperation and told me not to be downhearted if the undertaking seemed formidable at first as he would pull me through everything you will laugh when i tell you how at first his want of refinement prejudiced me but his earnest hearty initiative in the whole work has quite won me their relations afterwards were only indifferently good miss jones's standard was too strict he thought for rough workhouse ways the greatest shock to miss jones however was the nature of the human beings whom she was sent to nurse sin and wickedness she said had hitherto been only names to her now she was plunged into a sink of human corruption the foul language the drunkenness the vicious habits the bodily and mental degradation on all sides appalled her the wards she said in her first letter from the workhouse are like dante's inferno una and the lion was the title given by miss nightingale to her account of agnes jones and her paupers far more untamable than lions she had it is true the help of twelve trained nurses devoted alike to her and to their work but there were twelve hundred inmates and of the other nurses some were probationers of an indifferent class and the rest pauper nurses of whom miss jones had to dismiss thirty-five in the first few months for drunkenness then the standard of workhouse cleanliness was sadly low she found that the men wore the same shirts for seven weeks bedclothes were sometimes not washed for months the diet was hopelessly meagre compared to a hospital standard it is scutari over again wrote miss nightingale and miss jones was strengthened by the thought that the disciple was experiencing some of the difficulties which had beset the mistress by way of smoothing things over miss nightingale had written to the governor of the workhouse saying in effect that the eyes of the world were upon him as the leader in a great reform and he seemed so gratified and flattered by your letter reported miss jones miss nightingale was constant in advice and encouragement to her disciple no one ever helps and encourages me as you do i could never pull through without you god bless you for all your kindness such expressions show how welcome and how unfailing was miss nightingale's help and in every detail she was consulted 
there was all the friction which usually accompanies a new experiment there were disputes of every kind and all were referred to miss nightingale sometimes by mr rathbone sometimes by miss jones sometimes by both when things seemed critical mr rathbone would come up to see miss nightingale in person on less serious occasions he would write miss nightingale and dr sutherland would then sit as a kind of conciliation board and see how matters could be adjusted in one of dr sutherland's draft judgments submitted for miss nightingale's concurrence there is a blank left for her to fill as the note explains with soft solder his breezy manner may sometimes have been of comfort to his friend on one occasion when everything at liverpool seemed to be at sixes and sevens his note to miss nightingale was i don't despair by any means the entire proceeding has in it the elements of an irish row for they are all more or less hibernian there and they will cool down and so they did miss jones who was at first a little too stiff-necked soon found out a more excellent way and there is the nightingale touch in many of her later reports to-day they were a little cross but i got my way all the same she is much amused at the manner in which she now gets all she asks for she suggests things she is laughed at she persists a decent interval is allowed to elapse and then the things are suggested to her by the officials she says the suggestions are excellent and the things are done it is obvious to miss nightingale and dr sutherland that sooner or later the powers of the lady superintendent must be better defined obvious too that the worthless probationers and drunken pauper nurses must be cleared out but that is just one of the things that the experiment is meant to prove and meanwhile it is enough to drive in the thin end of the wedge so well does miss jones do her work that opinion in the workhouse and outside begins even to be impatient for the thicker end the experiment has so far been limited to the male wards the doctors go to miss jones and ask eagerly when she and more nightingale nurses are to be given charge of the female wards also old women who go in to see their husbands or brothers report wonderful changes in the house since the london nurses came visiting ladies report to the same effect the experiment is becoming popular and the liverpool vestry begins to wonder whether the cost hitherto borne by mr rathbone's private purse should not be thrown upon the rates miss nightingale has good cause to be pleased she has been throwing herself into the work not only in order to make the particular experiment a success but also because she wants to use it as a lever for promoting larger reforms part three liverpool had shown the way and miss nightingale resolved in her own mind that the way should be followed in london the struggle was long and arduous the fortune of political war went at a critical moment against her the victory of eighteen sixty seven was only partial and indeed there are other parts of her designs which even to this day await fruition but the insight with which from the very first as her papers show she seized the essential positions was masterly i can understand how it was that mr charles villiers not usually given to such outbursts of admiration exclaimed to a friend i delight to read the nightingale song about it all if any of them had the tenth part of her vigour of mind we might expect something the opening move in her campaign was made in december eighteen sixty four there had been an inquest on the death of one timothy daly which had figured in the newspapers as horrible treatment of a pauper the facts as ultimately sifted were not in this particular case as bad as they were painted in the press but the circumstances were distressing and public opinion was excited the situation was in that favourable condition for moving ministers when there is a feeling in the air that something must be done 
miss nightingale seized the opportunity to open communications with the president of the poor law board mr villiers she did not in this first letter disclose her whole scheme though she said just enough to show that she had considered the subject in its larger bearings she knew the art of beginning on a moderate and even a humble note she presumed to write because the case involved a question of nursing in which matter she had had some practical experience she had moreover been put in trust by her fellow-countrymen with the means of training nurses she described what was to be done in the liverpool infirmary by a matron who had been trained under the nightingale fund and she invited the minister's attention to the possibility of preventing the scandals with which the newspapers were ringing by starting some scheme of a like kind in london this letter in the composition of which dr sutherland had a hand went straight to its mark mr villiers at once replied december thirty one eighteen sixty four that he would like to communicate with miss nightingale personally on the subject in january the interview took place and this was the beginning of a long series of personal and written communications between them during the next few years on one occasion early in eighteen sixty five mr villiers being prevented by official business from keeping an appointment with miss nightingale begged her to receive in his place his right-hand man mr h b farnall poor law inspector for the metropolitan district mr farnall called and he and miss nightingale became as thick as conspirators in no time for poor law purposes he soon became the chief of her staff mr farnall was a man after her own heart he not only knew the facts with which he had to deal but he felt them with something of her divine impatience it's intolerable to me he said to know that there are some twelve thousand gasping and miserable sick poor whom we might solace and perhaps in some five thousand cases save and yet that we have to let them wait while the world gets ready to get out of bed and think about it all he was a keen and broad-minded reformer and miss nightingale's ideas were upon lines which he too had considered he was an old official hand but he hated official obstruction all this is treason to king red tape but i know that the old king is always happy after a change though he gets very red while the change progresses miss nightingale instantly set her new ally to work here as in all that she undertook she knew that the first thing needful was to collect the facts she drew up a schedule of inquiries to be filled up with regard to all the sick wards and infirmaries in london i will immediately issue your forms wrote mr farnall february sixteenth eighteen sixty five he required them to be filled up in duplicate and miss nightingale's set of them is preserved amongst her papers throughout the year she and mr farnall were engaged in the work of inspiring and incensing mr villiers in the direction of radical reform he was throughout very willing but he was becoming an old man he had many other things to think about and he was apt to see lions in the path moreover not all the officials that the poor law board were reformers there were those more highly placed than mr farnall who were of a very different opinion and some of the medical officers were inclined to dispute the necessity of any radical changes however on the subject of workhouse nursing mr villiers promptly authorized mr farnall to press upon the guardians the importance of employing competent nurses and he told the house of commons may five that in consequence of communications lately received at the poor law board from miss nightingale who was now taking much interest in the matter he was hopeful that great reforms in nursing might come about she however knew perfectly well that the only way to such reform was by reform also in administration and finance 
in the following month mr farnall persuaded his chief to insinuate into an innocent little poor law board continuation bill a clause which would enable the board to compel guardians to improve their workhouses but the clause was struck out mr farnall was disappointed and miss nightingale wrote to reassure him they must work all the harder to secure not by a side wind but by a direct move in the next session of parliament a full and far-reaching measure of reform your kind note said mr farnall july three has done me a world of good there is not a single expression or hope in it which i cannot make my own so we hope together for next year's ripened fruit i hope too that we may really taste it i pledge myself to you to relax in nothing till the task is done it is something to live for and something to have heard you say that such a victory will some day be claimed by me it is a pleasant thing to think of and i shall think of it as a soldier thinks of his flag so then miss nightingale set to work with the help of mr farnall and dr sutherland in elaborating a scheme for eighteen sixty six there are several drafts in her handwriting for the memorandum finally submitted to mr villiers and many notes and emendations by dr sutherland the scheme was sent also at a later date to mr chadwick one of the few survivors of the famous poor law commission of eighteen thirty four in order that he might submit it to john stuart mill whom miss nightingale sought to enlist in the cause the essential points and considerations were these a to insist on the great principle of separating the sick insane incurable and above all the children from the usual population of the metropolis b to advocate a single central administration c to place the sick and sane etc under a distinct administration supported by a general hospital rate to be levied for this purpose over the whole metropolitan area these are the a b c of the reform required a so long as a sick man woman or child is considered administratively to be a pauper to be repressed and not a fellow-creature to be nursed into health so long will these most shameful disclosures have to be made the care and government of the sick poor is a thing totally different from the government of paupers why do we have hospitals in order to cure and workhouse infirmaries in order not to cure taken solely from the point of view of preventing pauperism what a stupidity and anomaly this is the past system of mixing up all kinds of poor in workhouses will never be submitted to in future the very first thing wanted is classification and separation b uniformity of system is absolutely necessary both for efficiency and for economy c for the purpose of providing suitable establishments for the care and treatment of the sick insane etc consolidation and a general rate are essential to provide suitable treatment in each workhouse would involve an expenditure which even london could not bear the entire medical relief of london should be under one central management which would know where vacant beds were to be found and be able so to distribute the sick etc as to use all the establishments in the most economical way miss nightingale elaborated her views in detail going into the questions of hospitals nursing workhouse schools etc the cardinal point was what mr farnall spoke of to her as your hospital and asylum rate the minister was favourable to the idea i have conferred with mr villiers wrote mr farnall december twelve and he has decided on adopting your scheme he thinks it will be popular and just and i think so also but i think too that it will be the means of my carrying out a further reform some of these days that is my hope and belief if your plans are carried my struggle is half over under these circumstances i shall to-morrow commence a list of facts for you on which those who are to support your plan in print will be able to hang a considerable amount of flesh for i shall furnish a very nice skeleton 
miss nightingale had already through an intermediary interested the editor of the times in the matter and he had been to see mr villiers further public support came from the association above mentioned which sent a deputation to the poor law board mr villiers in reply april fourteenth eighteen sixty six foreshadowed legislation on miss nightingale's lines and he appointed mr farnall and another of her friends dr angus smith to inspect all the infirmaries their report has already been cited public opinion was ripe for radical reform but the whig ministry was tottering no fresh contentious legislation was deemed advisable and in june eighteen sixty six mr villiers was out the opportunity had passed and miss nightingale was left crying alas 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 end of workhouse reform chapter one parts one two and three